Thanks so much. Thanks. You've made it to the bitter end. These are my explorers, the persistent ones. Thank you for staying. Uh, I started my career as an explorer, and I had the great privilege of seeing some of the most remote portions of our planet, traveling places that others had never been before, places that will stick with me for my entire life, some of the most beautiful places on this planet. Some sucked, too, like this one did. From the Appalachian Trail, which I hiked from Georgia to Maine, to places deep in the Andes, while I was seeing this beauty, I was also exposed to so much challenge that we face as a planet. Whether coral bleaching or deforestation from illegal timber, infringement on wildlife habitat, this next slide's a bit graphic, or wildlife poaching, shark finning, or so many other challenges, the problems we face as a society are massive. And when I saw these things firsthand, I became motivated to do anything I could to make a difference. And that drew me to the sciences. I started tracking lynx and wolverines and grizzly bears. I started learning about these places that I was exploring in order to find ways that I could protect them, that I could work for their benefit. I started taking biological expeditions, combining my love of adventure, my passion for exploration with science, working directly with researchers who helped me develop protocols that could put me in the brain of a grizzly bear or a wolverine and move as these animals move across large landscapes, studying infringements to wildlife connectivity or their ability to move across, in this case, from Yellowstone to the Frank Church in Idaho, which is one of the last vestiges of connected habitat left in the lower 48 states. I had the opportunity to lead an expedition for National Geographic in Mongolia, where we skied for 26 days across negative 15 degree temperatures, hoping that maybe we would have the great fortune of seeing the tracks of one wolverine, if we were lucky. Well, on the very first night, we set up our tents went out for a quick ski, and in the morning, wolverines had already walked over our ski tracks. And for the next 26 days, we skied collecting 33 sets of DNA from scats and from hair. We discovered what's probably the densest wolverine population on the planet. So it was making a difference. I was loving what I was doing. I was out there exploring. I was passionate about what I was doing. And yet, I realized very quickly that there were tens of thousands of people like me who love the outdoors, and if we could harness that power, that collective will of people, give them some basic training where they could go out and make a difference like I was, the impact we could have would be so much bigger. And so I started the nonprofit organization Adventure Scientists, believing that if we could mobilize people in a common direction, that we could make some lasting change in the world. And one of the things I've come to love about my work just eight years later is how fortunate I am to work alongside some of the most brilliant people on the planet working to solve some of our biggest challenges. And I want to spend the rest of my time here really speaking to this quote from Paul Hawken. It says that if you look at the science about what's happening on Earth and you aren't pessimistic, then you don't understand the data. But if you meet the people who are working to restore the Earth, and the lives of the poor, and you aren't optimistic, you haven't got a pulse. I love that quote, and I'm reminded of that every single day as I get to work alongside my heroes, the people who are working to solve these challenges. And so I'm going to start with Dr. Mike Gilmore. Mike is uh, the head of the Harvard-wide consortium on antibiotic resistance, and I met him over beers in Boulder, uh, where he was, excuse me, in Bozeman, where he was on his sabbatical and where I live today. And we're sitting up on this rooftop bar, and Mike launches into a story that's really stuck with me ever since about bacteria. This is his life's work, and he's so passionate about it. And as he explained it to me, there's these kelp forests of bacteria that are sitting there waving in the wind, and through these kelp forests, 
are other bacteria with flagella that are floating through them and they're shooting serums at other bacteria that are putting up force fields. And when they can penetrate these force fields, they blow up the genes from that first bacteria and can consume those genes and actually take on their traits. That's the coolest thing ever. That's like zombies eating brains. It's amazing. It's actually got a name. It's called lateral gene transfer. And Mike had this hypothesis that if we could send explorers to the far corners of the planet, places like the middle of Greenland, where we collected Arctic fox scat, if we could collect insects from these places and scats from these places, that we might be able to find the bacteria that first had these traits, that first possessed antibiotic resistance, and therefore, through lateral gene transfer, has passed that on to other bacteria. And so we are on the hunt for the places that have never been exposed to human antibiotics before. Greenland, the middle of the Amazon, remote islands in the Pacific. We collected insects from Uganda. More than 110 countries we visited and brought back samples that Mike and his team have taken into the lab and using machine learning, partnered with the Broad Institute, another amazing researcher named Ashley Earle, another one of my heroes. They've been able to narrow the search for the genes responsible for antibiotic resistance and enterococcus bacteria down to less than 90 genes. They've asked us to go back out into the field and collect 10,000 more samples so that we can lower that threshold from 90 genes down to less than 20 so that they can start testing interventions against those 20 genes. I feel so lucky to work alongside Mike on such an important issue. Another of my heroes, Megan Parker Forney. Megan is the science officer at the Forest Legality Initiative at the World Resources Institute. And when I met Megan, she explained to me the breadth of the illegal timber harvest that happens around the world. So deforestation is responsible for about 15% of climate change, by most estimates. And illegal timber harvest is one of the leading causes of deforestation. And as Megan explained it to me, this is a criminal enterprise on par with the global heroin trade. More than $100 billion of timber are stolen out of forests every single year. That's staggering. This is a massive, massive issue. So Megan and her team came up with a solution. They imagined a solution. They thought if we could create what are called genetic reference libraries for these, different species of trees that are harvested out of these forests, we could create a mechanism by which people could, port officials, uh, suppliers, buyers, consumers, by which people could instantly know what species of wood they were looking at, where it came from, and whether it was legally or illegally harvested. We do that by going out across the range of these sought-after species. We collect tree cores, like the ones you saw these two women collecting. And when coupled with devices like the world's first handheld DNA sequencer, which is on the available on the market today for less than $1,000, we can empower these officials to make it far more difficult to transport illegal timber around the globe. Another amazing project that I feel so lucky to be part of. The next of our partners, these amazing people that I want to introduce you to, is Abby Barros. Abby lives out in Maine uh, and is an incredible researcher that came to us uh, concerned about plastics in our ocean, something we've heard a lot about lately. I'll let her tell you about this. Five years ago, we scooped up a half liter of water locally, brought it back to the Institute, looking under the microscope and seeing all these technicolored pieces of plastic led me to think of all of these larger questions. How is it affecting the ocean? Our drinking water, our microplastics everywhere, but I couldn't answer those on my own. So this is when I partnered with adventure scientists. Adventure Scientists is a nonprofit organization that unites explorers and scientists to solve some of the world's most pressing environmental issues in which access to data is crucial to resolving them. 
I worked with adventure scientists to train adventurers who would be collecting data for me around the world. I'm about to take a microplastic sample. I was able to get water samples from the Antarctic and the middle of the Pacific. We're gonna send this into the labs. Through the process of working with adventure scientists, I was getting closer to understanding the magnitude of this issue. After analyzing thousands of samples from around the world, we concluded that 74% of them contain microplastic pollution. Microplastics are one of the largest pollution problems that you've never seen. Without adventure scientists, I would have never been able to even dream about this breadth of data that I've been able to collect. The adventure scientist model lends itself to so many different projects, whether it be microplastics or forestry conservation or animal protection. This is just the beginning. Wouldn't that be awesome? Uh, I'm going to tell one more story about Dr. Rusty Rodriguez, and this is a partnership that's very near and dear to my heart. It was actually the very first partnership that we had as an organization. And this came together when I met two climbers, Willie and Damian Benegas. These are two world-famous Argentinian brothers. Uh, that climb all over the world. They guide tons of trips each year, and they had anecdotal evidence of plants up on Mount Everest. And so when they were going to Mount Everest, they came to me and they asked if we knew any researchers that might be interested in them trying to find these. So we scoured the literature and came across Rusty and his team, and when I talked to him, he was overjoyed to have this opportunity. So at the time, the highest known plant life on Earth in elevation was about 17,500 feet. So the idea that these plants could be up almost 5,000 feet higher than that was completely out of any realm of possibility. Rusty didn't believe it. Uh, but we gave him a protocol. We asked him to look systematically for this around Camp 2, where they thought they had heard it. And sure enough, Damien and Willie were able there. to collect. La torta. Working with scientists through Mr. Trenish's group, oh, Mount we don't need sound there. The so they were able to collect this moss up at 22,000 feet, shattering the known record for the highest known plant life on Earth. And what Rusty and his team discovered from this moss is that there's actually nothing unique genetically about the moss itself. But what they found were five fungi living symbiotically with this moss, which was enabling it to uptake nutrients in this oligotrophic or low nutrient environment. So fast forward seven years, and Rusty realized that he could take those same fungi to India and he could inoculate crops with these fungi across 600,000 acres last year. They have successfully doubled crop yields. It's scaling to 2.5 million acres this year, all without the need for synthetic fertilizers. In the midst of a growing population, this project has the potential to feed the planet it can make our crops more resilient to climate change, to drought, to floods. And it will impact millions and millions of lives. I love that I get to work with these people. It's amazing. And none of this would be possible without our volunteers. This is a collaboration between the scientists and the outdoor community, two seemingly disparate communities. These are people who come to us as hikers and bikers and climbers and skiers, these are artists and musicians, these are storytellers, people who come to us wanting to use their outdoor experiences to make a difference. We give them some basic training, we give them the opportunity to pursue their passions, and we've found that 80% of our volunteers self-report they're more likely to pursue careers in conservation after getting involved with these projects. 
This is a map of our successful expeditions that have gone out, the starting point of these. And if you were to actually draw the routes of these expeditions all around the globe, we'd cover the globe many times over. None of this would have been possible just a few years ago. Quality assurance and quality control is so important to what we do. We can use things like GoPro cameras to watch protocols being followed in the field. We can program our apps to remember uh, to remind people to rinse their bottles and caps at least three times. This is all stuff that is possible for the first time. Coupled with low-cost sensors, less than $500, we can now measure water quality in situ. We can place things like camera traps and audio listening devices that use AI to single out species. We can collect samples and send them to the lab, where AI and machine learning can isolate genes and learn far more than we ever could have in the past. So again, these are my heroes. These are our partners, and every single one of them has something in common, that they've come to us willing to step outside of their traditional fields, outside of the way science is traditionally done. They're people like Lisa Holesky and Betsy Howell, like Natalie Kerwald and Drago Saharescu, they're Randy Matchett, who's reintroducing the black-footed ferret to the American prairie. Roman Dial, who's studying glaciers and ice worms and tropical forests around the world. Ed Espinoza at the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and Katie Prudick. These are people who have recognized that by looking far afield from their traditional practice, by looking to something seemingly so disparate like adventure, that we can collaborate and rally together to solve incredible problems. Our job as leaders is to galvanize people and move people in one common direction towards a goal. And every single one of these people has chosen to step outside of their traditional roles and do that. So as each of you go home from this conference and think about your missions and what you're working on, don't just look to your field. Look at your collaborators today, and don't just look adjacent to your field. Think about how you can expand that network. Think about how you can look far beyond the traditional means of getting things done to rally us together and move us in one common direction towards solving so many of these issues. I feel so lucky to get to work alongside these people. These are my heroes. These are the people that keep my heart beating, and these are the people that keep me optimistic every single day. You guys are solving these problems, and you keep me optimistic every single day. Thank you so much for rattling through a very long day to hear this final presentation. I hope you will reach out. I hope you will get involved in our work. We need each and every one of you from business, from education, from the arts to come and join our team. I'll be here for a while and look forward to talking about how we can work together to imagine solutions. Thanks. Thank you.